Take it away, Sluggo. Again. Um, uh, hey, everybody, this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman back with everybody for the 123rd, count them 123, one, two, three Zoom calls. Um, uh, welcome to be uh, for our second of 2023. It's uh, we got, well, we got uh, 34 people with us to start, and uh, we've got a full agenda for our election protection uh, operation here, uh, along with our, um, our green power dimension. Generally, what we're doing, we're falling into a, a format, well, the first hour, we talk about election stuff, and the second hour, we do environmental stuff. We'll keep more or less to that uh, today, although we may get into the environmental stuff a little early, but... Um, it's great to see everybody as always. As you can see, I am at the beach and my fashion statement today is for our, our best dressed congressman. I actually had a, uh, Senator, I had a, uh, a brief moment there. I saw John Federer, Fetterman, uh, that's his name, right? Fetterman, uh, wearing a suit. Uh, I guess they make you wear a tie on the floor of the U.S. Congress. And there he was <laughs> standing in a suit. It looked like he was at his bar mitzvah, he looked very uncomfortable, uh, but there he was, John Fetterman in a suit. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna start, uh, if John Brakey does join us, we're gonna announce a little more detail about our national organization, the, uh, the um, Alliance for Grassroots Democracy, where we are gonna do two major agenda items rolling into the uh, 24 election. Uh, we are gonna be protecting our election and promoting uh, uh, paper ballots. And we do wanna have a discussion if Clint Curtis joins us about uh, scanning machines and uh, the, the, the need or not for them. It's one of the reasons we're gonna have John Brakey on us to talk about scanning machines. And the, um, then we're gonna uh, discuss, hopefully Ray McClendon will join us, we're gonna discuss the, the, the uh, shift to grassroots democracy and our emphasis on people who are going to be donating money to campaigns leading up at 24, we want that money to go to grassroots organizing and not to media uh, uh, advertising. So that's the first discussion we're going to have. We will discuss, as I say, the use of scanning machines. Um, we are then going to um, segue in and, and talk about Peru. We have uh, someone who's going to join us, thanks to Wendy Lederman, about the amazing things that are going on uh, in Peru. Um, and uh, also, um, uh, uh, we, uh, in the second hour, we're going to have a major focus with Camilla Reese, um, a great activist on uh, 5G, the spread of 5G, and also with Ron Leonard and uh, Tim, uh, the expert who's going to be joining us uh, on 5G. We're going to talk about the war against solar, which is really, really escalating. These these corporations really do not want a decentralized solar. And uh, we are in the, in the throes of that battle. The beeps you hear, by the way, are people joining us. So kind of like to leave that in. Um, um, so th th this is a big deal. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, outlook for us going ahead. I, I do want to start, I, I hate to keep starting our, our, our shows or our gatherings with memoriams for wonderful people who passed away. But uh, Steve, if you could throw that picture up. Uh, we lost uh, this past week, um, one of our greatest uh, rockers, uh, David Crosby there. Uh, I knew Cros, um, over the decades, he did a lot of anti-nuclear work. And um, he was, you know, if you read the obits um, and the stories of David Crosby's life, um, he, he seemed to alienate a lot of the people he worked with. And he talked about it, you know, he, he always referred to himself as having acted like uh, an a-hole, which we can say on this show. But uh, I knew him, you know, I would meet him uh, over the years and, and we would always be cordial. He he liked me in part because I, I was fighting and still am the Diablo Canyon nuclear plant and he lived directly downwind from Diablo Canyon. He really wanted that thing shut. And uh, he did a lot of great anti-nuclear work over the years. And I, for the past couple of uh, whatevers, I've been listening. Is there a, I've been listening to uh, uh, the, the first Crosby Stills Nash album. 
And it, it has not gotten old. It is still an incredibly great piece of work. We would play some of the music, but uh, it's probably get us thrown off YouTube for copyright violations. So uh, David, uh, David lived to 81, by the way. If you'd have asked anybody <clears throat> who knew David Crosby in 1970 or so, would he live to 81? I don't think anybody would have said yes. I mean, he, he really, uh, he survived. He was a survivor. He went through all sorts of hell. He was in jail. He was a drug addict. He had guns. I mean, he was an amazingly interesting character, David, and very, very smart. He was a really, really good guy to talk to. It was a lot of fun. And he gave me uh, what remains of my first and only ride in a Tesla. So thank you for that. David, you will be missed, but your music lives on. Okay, bro, thank you for that. Thank you, Steve. Uh, if you can take the picture down, we can move ahead now. Um, we are up to 50 people. Um, has John Brakey joined us? If not, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give the rap basically on um, on the uh, uh, what what we're gonna do with the Alliance uh, for Grassroots Democracy. Uh, Ray Lutz has joined us. Hi, Ray. Uh, Tatanka is with us. Um, a lot of great people. So uh, actually, very quickly, Tonka, Tatanka, if you could give us a quick update on Leonard Peltier, I know you're gonna do a lot more in a coming. Uh, gathering, uh, but uh, and I keep hearing a lot about Julian Assange. There does seem to be movement. Is there any movement to, to talk into you can tell us about getting Leonard Peltier out of jail? No, no substantive movement. I will have people closest to, closer to that trial, but you mentioned that maybe not everyone knows. I just want to say a little bit about the history of this and why I think he's still in jail. Well, why is Julian still in jail? He revealed all the workings of our empire. And he revealed truths that are really important for a democracy, right? And the elite didn't, don't like that. Um, they wanna make a uh, crime out of the uh, act of journalism. Leonard is a symbol of the wounded knee uh, resistance in the 70s, which is reminiscent of the original wounded knee resistance by the Lakota people. He is the symbol of a people who actually were standing up to have the US government live up to its treaty obligations and stand up for the culture and the rights of their people. The, the corporations that most covet the land on which native people live in the United States are the extractive corporations. And many of you may not be aware, but it's not, new, it's old, that the ultimate goal of the, the corporate class was to um, domesticize the native population, to have it become a melting pot, to have it have civil rights as they are, such that uh, to join with the rest of citizens and thereby nullify the entire history of them having autonomy over their own land and having treaty rights. You may know that the US government has broken, I don't know if there's a treaty right they've observed. Um, it's, it's a history of broken promises. Leonard symbolizes the integrity of the indigenous population here and that they want the U.S. to live up to its commitments. The corporations want that land. That's the oil. That's the uranium. That's all the stuff, and it ties directly into why they don't want democratized solar. Anyway, that's a larger discussion, but that's how important Leonard is. He's survived these 50-plus years in jail for there's no really real reason for him to be there at all. The case has totally fallen apart decades ago. So why haven't Democratic or Republican senators released him? I think it gets down to that. So I'll leave it for that for now. Harvey, you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted. Thank you much. Thank you for that. Uh, Tataka will have a deeper uh, discussion of that uh, later on, but very, very well stated. I mean, um, why can't, uh, let me ask you a question, Tataka. 
Why can't they just give him a new trial? Why can't the president of the United States uh, just say, well, okay, I'm not going to take a stand on this. He should have a new trial. Why is that such a big deal? Why is it such a big deal to come to truth and reconciliation on all the, the sins or violations of the empire? I mean, it just means uncovering decades and decades and hundreds of years of lies. And uh, how it works between, I can only imagine, I'm not privy to this, but how it works between the pressure of the most powerful moneyed people in the world and those who are in Congress and who are, sit in the seat of the president, who am I, I call a, a fairly well-paid temp worker. Um, <laughs> it's basically it, you know, the, the people that are there, the revolving door of the corporations and their lackeys are, are there for hundreds of years. The people who hold the office are there for a short period of time. So I think it just means owning up to the true history, the people's history of the United States, uh, now the people's spiral history of the United States that everybody should read. I think it's as, you know, as simple, as simple and as complicated as that. I will tell you one thing uh, from the history. Uh, you know, George Washington was a terrible Indian killer. He, 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 he really, as a general, he, he killed a lot of Indians. But And uh, he was in a, a battle, actually, when he was a young man in the British Army. He was in a battle with, around what's now Pittsburgh, and he was shot eight times and, and somehow managed to, uh, to survive. <clears throat> and the Indians, uh, the, the indigenous thought that was actually pretty amazing. They held him kind of in awe. And he had another name, was Kondokataris, Kono something like that, which meant um, a, a killer of villages. And so he was not a good guy to the indigenous, but he did respect them. And in fact, he adopted indigenous guerrilla tactics uh, to win the American Revolution. We never would have won the American Revolution without using indigenous tactics that George Washington learned from the, the Western tribes. Hardy, and, to, get, yeah. to get to the military connection, the most poignant moment in the whole resistance at Standing Rock to me were the veterans down on their knees making amends to the native people. Can you imagine the symbol, Leonard Peltier, of that resistance movement and another meeting of veterans bringing their friends and the power that that would have for our politics? There's yeah. many reasons why the people in power don't, they want him to die in jail. Yes, they do. And, um, you know, I'm sure they're going to try and hurry it up. Same as Julian Assange. They want him Same to as die. Julian Assange. Yes. They want him to die as well. So Washington, <clears throat> who had a sense of honor. I mean, I know I get in trouble with progressives defending George Washington, but there are a couple of things that he did. Uh, one, uh, first, most importantly, he did not make himself dictator. George Washington uh, ran the Revolutionary Army, and, the, and at the end of the war, he stepped down. I mean, where in history does that happen? People who win a revolution with an army <laughs> almost always keep the army and take over the country. Washington went back uh, to farm. And of course, his, his favorite crop, by the way, was hemp. There's no indication that he smoked it, but there's no doubt that he loved hemp. And he and uh, George, uh, Tom Jefferson had a major correspondent, correspondence about hemp. They loved raising hemp way easier than tobacco. But at any rate, <clears throat> When Washington became president, you know, there was a lot of, of course, conflict with the indigenous. And most of the country did not want to even sign treaties with the indigenous. They did not want to recognize the indigenous tribes as having any kind of sovereignty or any kind of credibility. And Washington is the reason that we had treaties, because he insisted that we that we do meet with these with the, the tribes and that we do have signed treaties. And he said, there's a quote, which I'll paraphrase. He said that if our country, if our new nation, the United States does not honor these treaties, it will be a stain on our honor. That was a quote from Washington. Now, <clears throat> very quaint, uh, as they would say now, the idea that we would even care about our honor, but um, we signed representatives of the government of the United States, 
signed over 800 treaties with the indigenous. More than 400 were subsequently ratified by the Congress. And treaties are supposed to be, <clears throat> they're, 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 they're at the top of the food chain in terms of law. You recognize treaties before you recognize any other law. Uh, they take precedence. And we, we have broken more than 400 treaties with the indigenous. Uh, I love when these, during the Cold War, uh, they, they were always yelling about how the Soviets never kept their word and always broke their treaties. And <laughs> here we are with the indigenous, uh, well over 400. And by the way, I can't, I can't resist this. Um, there was a conflict between the indigenous in Maine, the Penobscot, and the, and the government over land. <laughs> and what happened, I couldn't make this up, I'm sorry. In the 1950s, a, a tribal chief in Maine passed away. And they, they opened up his car and in his trunk was a treaty signed by George Washington. The document itself was worth a million dollars. And they took that treaty and there was a 30 year negotiation. And the tribe based on that treaty signed by George Washington forced in the courts a partial uh, acknowledgement of the, of the, and they got like $80 million. Harvey, yeah. Harvey, just another connection for people to think about. You know, the United Nations as it exists, there's, there's a dozen or two um, uh, colonizing countries there with that history. And then there's the vast number of people that are the colonized and they talk with each other, okay? Imagine Leonard Peltier free. Oh. Imagine, imagine U.S. representatives, State Department, uh, representative of the United Nations talking about honoring commitments, talk oh. about, you know, talk about human rights and to have Leonard Peltier and a, and a movement resurrect. Yes. They do not want to see any kind of movement re resurrect, period, much less that which is at the heart of everything. And I believe that our movement really needs to start with that truth and reconciliation process with the native people onto slavery, et cetera. That builds the unity that we need. Well, it, imagine them also talking about with Julian Assange. I think what's gonna happen with Julian Assange is he's gonna to go to Australia. You know, there's a, new, uh, there's a new prime minister in Australia as we've discussed. They're gonna have a hard time telling Australia, no, you can't have a Julian Assange. Uh, the, the problem is that, you know, we don't have, well, the indigenous have sovereignty uh, based on the, you know, the Supreme Court decision of, in, the, um, in the Cherokee case. So um, it's going to be, I just hope to God that he lives. Uh, we, we need to pray for the health of Leonard Peltier, A, for his reason, you know, for him personally, but for what he stands for and what it would mean to have him free. Uh, that, that would be an incredible event. Uh, to get him out. Biden has um, shown no uh, inclination. Uh, there's been nothing come to there. But, you know, we have to remember as progressives, and most of us are, of course, on this call. By the way, there are 73 people on the call uh, uh, now. Um, but we have to remember that, that Bill Clinton went eight years without dealing with Leonard Peltier. At the, he was approached many, 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 many times. At the end of his, his term, he had the ability to, you know, at the end of their terms, presidents traditionally give pardons. And he pardoned some guy named Mark Rich, who was a total multimillionaire crook and would not free Leonard, just outrageous. And then in comes Barack Obama, and he goes eight years without freeing Leonard. I mean, George W. Bush, you can understand. But you got two Democrats, 16 years between them, and they never freed Leonard, and they never gave him a new trial. Completely outrageous. Just and I'm I'm aware, RV, of an of uh, a move that seemed possible for a while through Donald Trump, through people, and the whispering in his ear was, "You, if you free him, you'll be able to do what Obama could never do." And some people were hopeful that Trump would release 
Leonard, but nobody with with the pressure that they get from the extractive industries has been willing to stand up to that. Yeah. And then we go back to our history of Kennedy and people who stand up and want to make changes, things like that. It's outrageous. It's really outrageous. Uh, Justin LeBlanc, you've had your hand up. You always have intelligent things to say. Then Mimi and then Wendy. And also, uh, Lynn, Lynn Feinerman, you sent me a note I can't read. So if you're on, that'd be great. Go ahead, uh, Justin. Justin LeBlanc, are you unmuted? Tatanka, uh, there was some recent Supreme Court activity around states wanting to enforce state laws in on indigenous reservations over and above indigenous laws. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's become of that? Oh, that, that's still in play. Uh, state of South Dakota, particularly, um, and the whole the thing it's it's come in as I know it from Danny Sheehan around the Indian Child Welfare Act, where they want to. I don't know. Do we have time to talk about this or not? Yeah, go ahead, real quickly. Okay. We'll okay. Let's do it. The, the, the case is it actually came out of Texas, but it, it it it's happened a lot in the Dakotas. It was a case in Texas where. Um, there is a law that the United States Congress passed that Danny Sheehan and Sarah Nelson were a part of a couple decades ago that said that if a child is taken from its indigenous family, it has to, uh, for some reason, for alcoholism or abuse or something, that child has to be placed in an indigenous home or at least somewhere in the tribe. Um, and that law has been on the books. So some years ago out of Texas, a young couple wanted to adopt a uh, an indigenous young person, and the, it was an infant. And they adopt, they, they put in for adoption, and it was given to them because immediately in the, in the week or two after the baby was born, they couldn't find an immediate relative in the, uh, I believe it was a Lakota child. <clears throat> Then there was an auntie about two months in who said, fine, I, will, I want the child. They went to court and following the law, it was taken from the white couple and given to the auntie. They filed suit. Some of the money from the suit came from Exxon. Oh, yes, yeah, this is true. And it, uh, it went to the state Sup Supreme Court and then up to the federal Supreme Court and then back and forth. The argument was, that this child is deserving of all civil rights as a U.S. citizen, not as an indigenous person. The, the hope is to undermine, and thank you, Justin, for this, to undermine the law of the land and the treaty rights. So why was Exxon involved? You know, they're, they're looking for any kind of Trojan horse to change the legal status of of native people to that of the, the rest of us and everything we have to do to get our rights and to take away their autonomy as, as, individ, as autonomous nations to take away their land, basically. And so that's what's in play right now, bouncing back and forth between the state and the US Supreme Court. I bet Exxon is very, very heavily behind the uh, refusal to uh, do, give justice to Leonard Peltier. I mean, obviously, the, the extractive industries do not want indigenous rights uh, to, to proceed here. So, you know, that's something I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about. Uh, uh, Dennis Bernstein from uh, Flashpoints, welcome. Uh, uh, Dr. Ruth, uh, great to have you with us as well. Fellow KPFK supporter. You know, if I was to get, get, get on here and start to explain what's going on in Pacifica Radio, <laughs> you people wouldn't believe it. So. We'll, we'll defer that for another millennium. Thank you, uh, Tatanka, for that explanation. It's amazing how the uh, um, issue with the indigenous uh, continues. Uh, Lynn Feinerman, I'm gonna go to Mimi in a minute, but Lynn, I, I wanted to uh, give you the chance you texted me uh, to discuss your program real quick. Uh, do you wanna do that? Uh, Lynn Feinerman, are you on? are you unmuted? Yeah, I mean, can you hear me? Yes, go yes, ahead. we can. And then we'll go um, to Wendy and Mary. Yeah, 
um, uh, <clears throat> the new women wrestling radio program, which um, uh, I put a link to it um, in the chat, is all about this very issue. It's three key women who were involved in the um, truth and healing cycles in Canada and the truth and healing cycles that have begun here with Deb Holland in the United States and who visited the Vatican bringing an empty cradle board to the Pope. And um, it's all about what you discuss, Harvey, um, in, in your wonderful history book uh, regarding the doctrine of discovery. And um, the upshot of it, uh, the upshot of the program is that we must revoke the doctrine of discovery. We must get the Vatican to revoke that doctrine of discovery. So anyway, I, I just put the link in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Your your stuff is great. Much appreciated. Um, and, uh, and Harvey, just before you go on, yeah, please. Um, you know, there's been a battle. Uh, it's it's it, it's taken another form now. But Steve Bannon at one time had a little kind of castle given him by wealthy people right near the Vatican. Was organizing fascists right out of the Vatican um, with with Zoom calls, etc. And he, you know, his his real hatred is for this Pope Francis. There's a number of things that that he disagrees on, but key among them will be the doctrine of discovery. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, uh, okay, um, uh, Paul Newman, it's great to see you. I love <clears throat> I love your hat. You look like you just knocked off a gas station. So <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, uh, Mimi, Mimi Spenberry, uh, please, and then Wendy. Hi, thanks everyone. Nice to see you. Really glad I could join you today. Um, I, I have a quick question and then I have a, a follow a quick follow up to what Tatanka had said. But are we going to be discussing uh, solar today? Yes. Okay, yeah, cool. We have I'll, a I'll lot just of solar today. I'll, I'll be quiet then. So thank you. Glad oh, to yeah. hear that. But <laughs> yeah, that's a super hot issue here in California, as you know, Harvey and oh, everybody. Yeah. So um, yeah, what I wanted to tell Tatanka and others is that. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee introduced last legislative se uh, season a bill for um, truth, uh, truth, racial healing, and transformation. So this would be something similar to what they have in Canada. So may I read a quick blurb yeah. about that? And then yeah. I will uh, put the link in the chat. It's from Vox. So uh, Congressman Lee shared this on the National Day of Racial Healing, which is the day after Martin Luther King Day. So she wrote, we are reminded that systemic racism contributes to life threatening the disparities in healthcare, our economy, environment, and so much, oh, so much more, excuse me. My own mother almost died while giving birth to me and was denied critical care due to the color of her skin. So last paragraph, Senator Booker and I are pushing for a US commission on truth, racial healing and transformation because we cannot heal without a national truth telling moment. And so indigenous folks are mentioned in the preamble as well. So this is something really great that, you know, perhaps PDA can support or put out an action alert to contact our Congress members or maybe something our liaisons want to talk about. Cause I mean, we're, we're it's, it's just shocking. Uh, systemic. Let me, yes. let me just jump in. Yeah. Uh, PDA is 100% in support of that. We were involved with the drafting of the legislation We've been running um, action alerts and um, lobbying for that legislation. And it's it's very, very important. And I'm so glad that you brought that up and that's something that we need to revisit in the new Congress. We had quite a few co-sponsors in the last Congress, but every new Congress, we start out at zero. So we need to uh, get, get in, into gear and, and uh, get behind Barbara Lee, who's on our National Advisory Board, somebody who we're very oh. close with, and um, and make this happen. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Yes. So that was shared uh, last Tuesday, which is the National Day of Racial Healing. And thanks for that, Mike. And, and thank you for my time. And thanks again to Tonka for that update. Thanks, everyone. And since you, you, you got to be careful when you refer to history, because you get me going. In the Declaration of Independence, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson put in a paragraph or a line denouncing the king's um, um, complicit, complicity 
with slavery. It's really weird, Tom. Jefferson, who owned slaves, put in a very anti-slave paragraph uh, into the Declaration of Independence, and the Congress took it out. But they left in a, a line about the king um, leaving the colonists vulnerable to attacks by the indigenous. He did not use the term indigenous, but it's very, very anti-indigenous in the Declaration of Independence. So we ought to have yeah. a movement to pull that out. Of the They're declaration. called savages. In, yes. <laughs> right. Which is inconscionable, so. And, and Jeff Jefferson promised the tribes of, of the Delaware tribes that if they adopted white ways, um, they, that they would be accepted in American society or mainstream uh, United States. Uh, at the same time that he bought Louisiana with the specific agenda item of moving the Indians out there, which he, he didn't do, but Jackson, actually Martin Van Buren did it, but there you go. So we, our history uh, with the indigenous in, in relations with this country goes all the way back to the Declaration of Independence for God's sakes. So maybe we can uh, rectify some of that. Uh, Wendy, Wendy Lederman. <laughs> Thank you. Um, great conversation. It's important that we're discussing this. Um, kind of going back a little bit to um, to Peltier and Assange, and um, you guys brought up Exxon, and that was what I wanted to just touch on was really the overview, because there's another name we're forgetting here too, which is Donzinger. And um, really the kind of the, the elephant in the room, I guess, is the, the corporate takeover of the government in a sense, where all of this, even our wars, everything, you know, whether it's, you know, the, the, the war logs that WikiLeaks revealed was because we're at war to get oil for Halliburton and to make guns and bombs for Raytheon and Northrop Gunham. And, and it's always leads back to the financial interest. And when we see with, um, with, uh, with Donzinger, I mean, we have a case there where Chevron um, bought Texaco, who had dumped, I mean, thousands and thousands of gallons of oil, thousands of people in, in Ecuador have been dying for years from this. And, and Donzinger won a settlement for the people and was able to um, declare the guilt of the oil companies. And he spent like a year and a half, I think, or longer on, um, on house arrest because Chevron went in and was able to hold him in contempt somehow. Like the, the actual corporation was using the court system. And our our government, in a sense, is just working by proxy for these corporations. And hopefully um we'll have a chance um um prepared to speak about um the the forest defenders in Atlanta right now. So whenever we have time if we get a chance, um, but right now we have the first eco activist was slain was murdered was killed and shot in um a 26 year old kid was shot in the forest in Atlanta trying to defend um from what's being called cop city from being built in the last green space in Atlanta there so hopefully we'll have a chance to discuss that a little bit more but it's all about let's, corporate let's do that now uh, what was this kid's name I read I read about him um I wanted to have some I wanted to talk about him he's a beautiful guy and um he was murdered by the police um, is there a forest in Atlanta? What, what, what is that? What's that all about? So um, it's the Wallini, um, the, I think it's Wallini land. And even some of the Lakota people had sent people down there because they've been occupying this last forest space that was like partially home to the creek. And it's like the last forest area within Atlanta. And right after, ironically, right after the BLM protests, yeah. They got some harebrained idea to build what's called a cop city. And it's this massive training facility in um in the heart of the city that um I, I think Israeli forces are going to be training the police on on how to suppress rebellion and civil unrest. And it's just, I mean, a real militarization, largest like police school. Like, what did they think was going to happen when they decided to put this there? And just a quick side note, like it's not too far from what we used to be called the School of the Americas, where we would train the paramilitary to go down to South America and team up with all the bad people doing bad things there. So it's just really weird there. So you had 
these forest defenders naturally, like, what do you think is going to happen when you try to take this sacred land and put a giant cop school there? Like you're, you're obviously instigating something. And so um, finally, after a year of the cops just doing these intimidation tactics and going in and using tear gas and arresting people under domestic terrorism charges, especially people, welcome John Brakey, I see he just got here, um, especially do domestic terrorism charges against people that were coming from other places to sit in with these people that have like made a community within the forests and tree houses. They have, you know, um, kitchens and all kinds of things like set up to occupy. And so the cops went in last Wednesday and the reports from local residents and from other protesters was that it was just one loud boom of gunfire. But the, the official reports with the, the Guardian and Rolling Stone and Democracy Now! in a lot of places are saying that there's potentially a cover up going on is the, the official report is that the kid, um, Manuel Turan, known as Tortuguita or Little Turtle, Venezuelan, um, 26, he was shot. And the report is that he fired first and shot a state trooper in the stomach. But there's no they're not releasing any body cam footage. They're saying there is no body cam footage, but there's photos of the cops that are wearing the body cam footage. There's no details being released. We don't know how many times um, or what range uh, Tortuguita was shot at. There's no details being released. The, his mother is calling it an assassination. And all of the, the witness reports are not lining up with what the police said, but he's the first eco-activist, peaceful demonstrator to be murdered on American soil. And it's a really heartbreaking story. And there's been vigils all weekend and um, just uh, other protests throughout the country in all different cities that aren't being reported, just like Peru is not being reported on right now, all the, um, the, uh, the uprisings that are happening. But please look up um, the Atlanta forest defenders and support them. Look into this cop city because it's just dirty from the start. What did they think was going to happen when they put that there? Thank you. Right. Well, probably what happened is what they wanted to happen. Thank you for that, Wendy. We'll come back to Peru uh, before we finish the hour. But uh, Mary, uh, Mary, um, uh, Dorothy and Dennis have hands up. So uh, go ahead, Mary, please. Mary Butler. Uh, we do Stone have John Brakey here today. Uh, yes, uh, John Brakey, welcome. We're going to get to you in a couple minutes. Um, we've been um, having a great, you know, this is what happens when you have a great group of people. There, there's always great stuff to talk about. I want to thank, by the way, uh, John Steiner. Um, welcome to the call and thank you for your generous donation to help continue these calls. We really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Uh, Mary and then Dennis. I don't know where Dorothy went. Mary Stonewall Butler and then Dennis B Bernstein. Hello. Yeah, hi. Go ahead, Mary, real quick, please. Oh, there's Dorothy. Uh, real quick. Um, I want to point out uh, if we could overturn the case law that Reagan put out there that made it deregged monopolization, uh, monopolies of radios and uh, TV stations, because he's the one that reneged on that and made it to where you could now monopolize and own more than three or six or whatever. Um, we had to look to that case law in order to protect Pacifica Radio. Ah. Um, when it comes to Exxon, uh, people, if you don't know it, when Exxon Valdez finally paid out, um, I knew one of the families in the check had 0.00, .00 on the check because the lawyers and everybody else ate it all up and none of the people that really suffered got any payback. And then finally, how come we're not talking about the fact that the uh, U.S. economy right now is coming, you know, the debt is coming due this month and what are we going to do about that? And what's it going to do to America? And if, if truly we wanted to save America for all of us, It'd be nice if the indigenous nation would buy up that debt from the foreign countries, because there's two ways to take a country. One is war and one is owning their debt. And I don't like all these other countries owning our debt. It, it, I think it'd be more fun if uh, the native cultures here were able to buy that debt. I'm sure China and other countries would get a big kick at it and sell it at a cheaper rate than what they got it, because that's how you sell debt. Okay. You always Thank you, Mary. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I will point out that the, uh, the indigenous did buy Alcatraz <clears throat> back from the mayor of San Francisco for $24 in junk jewelry. And, and they kept it for 
almost two years. So there you go. Uh, Dennis, uh, uh, Dorothy, are you off the phone? Dennis and then Dorothy. Uh, okay. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate ahead, it. Dennis. Obviously, I appreciate this beautiful uh, get together every week. It's so important, getting more important all the time. We're going to devote the, sh the entire show tomorrow to the killing uh, uh, in Atlanta. We have the attorney and some of the key activists that we will have on uh, the show tomorrow. It's absolutely horrific. I just want to remind people, I was in Tucson, Arizona in 1985 and 1986, covering what was called the Tucson Sanctuary Trial. And what and that was about folks who were fleeing El Salvador and Guatemalan, among other things, Guatemalan death squads and who were being brutalized. Well, while while we're covering and hearing unbelievably horrific Nazi stories, by the way, during the trial, uh, somebody who who was part of the liberators of the Nazi camps in Germany stood up on the first day of the trial. His hands were full of blood and he slapped them against the wall and said, the blood of Central America is all over our hands. But while I'm covering that trial in Tucson, the Tucson Police Department is training cops from Guatemala and El Salvador uh, based on a U.S. Uh, finance problem. So essentially, as we continue to do in Haiti and other countries, we were training the death squads that were forcing the people out of the country in the same kind of structure uh, as what's happening in Atlanta. It's extremely dangerous. And they're, not only is it horrible for destroying the environment, but they're going to be bringing in the killers to train. Terrible. Dennis, would you put in your uh, in the chat, <clears throat> your, your show, Flashpoints, is on in, in the Bay Area at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific time every day. Uh, how do people who are not in the Bay Area, you're also on in L.A. a lot, but how do people get to you? You're, are you online? KPFA.org. KPFA.org. Flashpoints.net. KPFA.org. Flashpoints.net. If you go to kpfa.org, just either hit the live button at five o'clock or uh, there's an archive. By the way, the, the program is uh, podcasted everywhere. So if you want to get it, you can get it by podcast as well. Thank you, Hawk. Thank you, Dennis. Great to have you on as always. Uh, Dorothy Wright. Dorothy. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, anybody who gets my newsletter knows I've been covering Tortuglina's um, killing and all that, what's been going on all over with uh, the environmental fascists, whatever you want to call them. Uh, I just thought it was interesting this morning. I found an article on Sheer Post, Peru's natural resources, CIA link, linked U.S. ambassador meets with mining and energy ministers to talk investments. This is what's going on while they're murdering the indigenous people of Peru for protesting that their president was jailed. Right. You know, you just can't make this stuff up. It's all so evil. And if anybody hasn't followed what uh, went on with the, uh, why, why is his name not coming to me? The, the, the Chevron, um, Chevron gentleman. Uh, they, they, they totally hijacked the whole legal process. The government would not, would not prosecute him. So they got a special judge and special court to prosecute him. They put him in jail. They had him under house arrest. Uh, Chevron owns this country. It's, it was just appalling. And now it's going to the Supreme Court. I have my doubts, but maybe they'll be outraged enough to, to do something about it. Um, I'm on, he has a really good Instagram uh, account. If you want to know what he's been up to, he's, what, he's what's his on name? There. Dorothy, what's his name again? Steve, Steve, Don, Steve Donziger. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's, great. yeah, he's an amazing man, so brave, so strong. He won billions of dollars for Ecuador from Chevron, and they weren't about to pay it. So they, right. they, just, they took away his, li his law license. Right. 
That, it's it's and outrageous. And it's, if anybody wants to see the Belmarsh Tri Tribune is online, you can get your own. You can watch it on YouTube. Um, Amy Goodman this morning had an excerpt from it. If you don't want to watch the whole two and a half hours, she has good excerpt from it this, uh, today on her website. Uh, Stephen you know, Bonz you just don't know what to do anymore. Okay. I mean, just keep Stephen Bonziger is being targeted for practicing law effectively. <laughs> right. And I got to tell you, the, the extent to which this country will go, uh, Eugene V. Debs, who was born and raised in Terre Haute, Indiana, and was uh, you know, one of the most, probably the most famous la labor leader in the history of the United States, gave a speech against war uh, two months from the end of uh, World War II, one, and they put him in jail for 10 years and they took away his right to vote. Can you imagine this? This guy was born and raised in Indiana. He was a great, great public citizen. And because he spoke against war, they retracted his right to vote and put him in prison. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, Jeffrey Barto, real quickly, uh, and then we're gonna go to John Brakey. Yeah, Jeffrey, real quick, please. Jeffrey, you gave uh, a great- We're talking, we're talk thank, thank you. Uh, we're talking about Peru, right? Uh, Wendy, did the gentleman who was gonna speak to us from Peru, is, is he with us? Yes, Lorenzo Canizares, he's oh, on. Okay, John, if you can wait a couple minutes, we do wanna talk John. about Peru real quick. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey, John. real quick. And what, what, Lorenzo, my, my, you, my, uh, my question you, my question involves Peru. All right, well, why don't we let Lorenzo... All right, go ahead, Jeffrey, real quick. And Lorenzo, if you'll answer Jeffrey's question, that'd be great. Go ahead, right. Jeffrey. Lorenzo, are you there? Go. Yes, I am here. Uh, all right. Uh, you want to start with a question or... Yeah, I wanted to know if there, if there's a, if this, if this is being committed. In, uh, you can back me up here. Justin LeBlanc, if you want to. Yeah, I want to know if democracy is being committed, committed and committed, but or otherwise known as crimes against democracy in Peru. Okay, good that question. Good question. Thank you for that, Jeffrey. Excellent. Go ahead, and Lorenzo. If you'll introduce yourself um, and 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 give us a, a quick talk on Peru, we'd appreciate it. Okay, uh, I didn't understand the question well, uh, uh, but uh, let let me. Ask start by uh, saying that uh, I consider uh, what's happening in Peru uh, the most important event in humanity today. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because it's a, if a victory of the popular forces in Peru uh, happens, and I, and I tell you the truth, uh, the way I'm, I'm, I'm saying it, I don't see any other avenue but a victory in in Peru, uh, and that uh, if that happens, uh, then um, we will have uh, a, a domino effect in many in many other uh, uh, places in the world where uh, white supremacy uh, is in uh, hot water and uh, and in danger. Um, uh, as you know, I mean, there have been a, a trend uh, towards more progressive forces winning uh, elections in uh, in, uh, in South America uh, and Central America. Um, and uh, one of the things that um, it, it, we need to remember when we're talking about winning elections is that uh, you're talking about uh, the the presidential power. Uh, uh, these people uh, that are elected uh, not necessarily have a control of the of the of the system. Uh, the, the, the system uh, operates um, in the same way that our system here operates. Uh, it probably even more uh, blunt uh, in those countries. Uh, because the the laws are somewhat uh, uh, somewhat uh, weaker uh, in Peru. Um, uh, uh, um, Pedro Castillo got elected, and uh, uh, since day one, uh, they tried to. Um, uh, what I mean, they is the the opposition that will be the the kind of uh, uh, an equivalency to the Republican Party here. Uh, uh, have been trying to uh, um, uh, create uh, a situation where uh, Castillo uh, wouldn't be able to govern. And um, 
Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, Jeffrey, because uh, what ha happened uh, in Peru is an inability uh, for a democracy to be exercised and uh, uh, and um, uh, created a situation uh, where Castillo somewhat was kind of forced to um, uh, do uh, what he did uh, and uh, uh, that situation uh, gave uh, an excuse uh, towards um, uh, the, the people that wanted to hurt the Peruvian people, uh, you know, wanted to maintain the control. When the, the, in the beginning of the conversation here tonight, uh, a lot of the things that were talked about Leonard Pertier and uh, the, the, the history that uh, Harvey was talking about in, re, in regards to um, the and the Native Americans experience history, um, this um, thing um, um, is, is very similar uh, to towards uh, what uh, is ha happening in, uh, in in Peru. I mean, this uh, um, you know, it's a it's a class war uh, veil in um, uh, in racial racial terms, uh, which is in many ways again the situation that we are facing here in, in the United States. Uh, we are in a, involved in a class war that is being uh, uh, circumscribed by uh, uh, external issues uh, uh, that have been very, very productive for, for uh, uh, th those people that uh, uh, maintain control of our uh, economics in, in society. Uh, and. Um, um, so that that is that is uh, uh, um, and and the one aspect that uh, we should point out in regards to um, uh, the class war component mm -hmm. is why is it that some a newspaper like the New York Times consider the 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 best paper in the world uh, hasn't a, you in January 19th, a few days ago, nothing. I, uh, today, nothing. Nothing in Peru. Um, I mean, are, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but um, just to get, uh, just for the interest of time, I'm, if we could uh, enlighten people on what's not being reported, as you're seeing, um, okay. just let us know. Um, so we had um, Castillo come into power, and he was up against these fascist forces. So I guess he got rid of the Congress, and they ousted him. And now there's like massacres happening in, happening in the streets because there's people like massive amounts of indigenous and peasants and like proletariat in the streets now and they're being slaughtered. It, it, can you just let us know what's going on with that, please? Thank you. Let, let, yeah, let yeah. me update uh, uh, Lorenzo for a sec. <clears throat> We're gonna go to the top of the hour. We have seven minutes left <clears throat> on Peru. Um, if, if you can explain, Wendy, who Lorenzo is and, so we can introduce him properly. Um, at the top of the hour, we're going to stop this Peru di di discussion and we'll break the tape. So we'll have a, 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 a holistic um, presentation. In the second hour, we're going to be joined by Camilla Reese, who's on with us to talk about 5G and also a brief presentation uh, from John Brakey uh, on the national organization. Uh, we will discuss that in greater detail next week, but I want John to give us a quick uh, taste beforehand. Okay, Wendy, so if you'll tell us who Lorenzo is, we've got six minutes, and then we can uh, we can wrap this uh, up nicely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Harvey, and thanks, Lorenzo, for being here. Lorenzo Canizares is, um, he's the lead of the um, uh, Miami, the Labor Community Alliance of South Florida, um, which is just a network of all the key players in Florida, really, and all the progressive organizations. Um, and he's uh, Cuban-American. And he's also done some great grassroots organizing in Pennsylvania. Um, he works a lot with all the, the labor unions and the education unions and environmental groups. I mean, you, you name it, he's there. And so I'm also looking forward to having him um, be a part of the future uh, talk with just the grassroots organizing and getting Florida involved. But um, Lorenzo really has his um, finger on the pulse with a lot of what's going on in Latin America and um, what's going here with, again, I'll just say the word, the proletariat and the workers. So thank you so much for being here. A very dear friend of mine. Thank you, Lorenzo. Take it away. Uh, Lorenzo, thank you, Wendy. Thank it's you for inviting me. to have you with us. If you can give us in five minutes what's going on in Peru, that I know it's a tough task, but it would be great. We'd be honored to hear it from you. Okay. Uh, 
well, at this time, it's, uh, it seems like all hell is breaking loose. And uh, today I was watching uh, uh, videos of uh, the, the police uh, entering the university, uh, San Marcos University, and uh, they were um, uh, what they were shooting. Uh, they, I don't believe, uh, at least when I saw the video, that, that they have killed anybody yet. But uh, they have been at the, as the, the last time I, I read that uh, they have been already 53 deaths uh, in, um, in, um, in in Peru. Uh, basically, what you have there now is a, a, a situation not too different in a larger uh, uh, way that will happen in New York City with Occupy New York. Uh, the, 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 they, they, they're calling it uh, La Toma de Lima, which is uh, basically Occupy Lima. And, uh, uh, and the, the, the thing with that is that uh, uh, basically they have four uh, 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 points that they want uh, 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 done. Uh, one is the resignation of the of uh, who before was the vice president, uh, Dina Bulwarte, uh, who she's now the president. Uh, and uh, she has been basically the person in charge of all these uh, uh, murders uh, that have happened in, uh, in Peru. Uh, they want to, uh, um, they, 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 they want to uh, create a situation where um, uh, the, 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 there was a, con a new constitution uh, being written. Uh, the last, the constitution that they're working in now from uh, is a constitution that uh, was uh, done by uh, uh, Alberto Fujimori, who uh, is in jail now uh, from, uh, 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 you know, corruption. And uh, his daughter is the main uh, leader, uh, the ideological leader of the opposition, uh, Keiko. Keiko Fujimori, and uh, the, the, the one the new constitution, because the, the, the constitution there, I mean, if we have problem here uh, with our system in terms of being able to move, to, to move around it, uh, it, 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 multiply that by two. And that, that's, uh, that, that would be the situation in, in Peru. It's a, it's a very uh, confining uh, a constitution. So that's, that's one of the things that the people are asking. People are asking also for the uh, new elections. Um, uh, they are promising elections uh, in, in uh, 2024. Uh, people want uh, those elections right now. Uh, as uh, in order to be able to uh, ch uh, change uh, the government. So, I mean, we have the resignation of Dina Bubarte, a uh, new constitution, uh, new elections, and the freedom of Pedro Castillo. Pedro Castillo is a very interesting person because a very okay, Castillo, um, Pedro um, Castillo uh, is, is a, yeah. If you'll do that, real, tell us real quickly, and then we're gonna have to wrap, and we want you back next week because we, we, we need to dis have this a greater discussion. Um, and it would be really great. So right. tell us who this guy is that we want freed, and then you'll come back next week and we'll talk more about Peru and about Atlanta, okay? All right, all right, that's a, that, that's a deal. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank and you. I enjoy and thank you very much for having me. And stay with us because we're gonna be discussing something that we want you involved with is a new national organization. So uh, this, uh, this first hour, uh, Steve and Mike, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap. This has been the 101st hour of the 123rd Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition Zoom meeting. <clears throat> Our first hour is usually taken with politics and protecting democracy. Our second hour goes into the environment, but we're gonna start our second hour with John Brakey and discussion of a, a very quickly, uh, a new political organization and then we'll go to Camilla Reese and talk about 5G uh, uh, and, and other incredibly important uh, environmental and health issues. Thank you so much, uh, Steve Caruso and Mike Hurst for engineering, uh, Wendy Lederman, my Reese and so many others who are involved in putting this all together. We have 78 people with us and we're gonna segue. <clears throat> and thank you listeners at Progressive Radio Network. If you wanna see or hear the second hour of this, go to the uh, site <clears throat> electionprotection2024.org where all these shows are archived. So we are now going to uh, sign off, briefly break the tape, and start a second 
uh, holistic piece of the the uh, the Greek 